America's godly heritage dates back more than 400 years. But many people ignore the fact that the United States was founded on biblical principles. A few months ago, In Touch broadcast a very special message from historian David Barton entitled, Is America a Christian Nation? The response was so overwhelming that we're airing this important program again for Veterans Day. David Barton is the founder and president of Wall Builders, an organization that presents America's forgotten history and heroes with an emphasis on our nation's moral and religious heritage. An expert in historical and constitutional issues, David also is a best-selling author and was named by Time magazine as one of America's 25 most influential evangelicals. After the message, join David and me when we discuss how rediscovering the truth about American history can help lead us to a brighter future. Obey God and leave all the consequences to Him. You fight your battles on your knees. We reap what we sow, more than we sow, and later than we sow. Stand tallest and strongest on our knees. If necessary, God will move heaven and earth to show us His will. It is an honor to be with you this morning, and we really have a remarkably blessed history in America. I'm going to share some of that with you this morning, and let me kind of say up front that we've been very blessed in our organization, Wall Builders. We have about 100,000 documents that predate 1812, so I'm going to show you some of those really old documents this morning, but we've got thousands of documents of those who signed the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution, and documents from black history and constitutional history and church history and military, you name it. It's a lot of fun to go back and look at that. And so what I want to do this morning and kind of turn in that direction is just remind us that this is really the time of the year when we start to celebrate. But it's also a time when we specifically celebrate what it was that 56 individuals did when they gave us the Declaration of Independence. That declaration is literally the foundation of our government. That is the foundation on which they later erected the Constitution of the United States. And to this day, we continue to hold the declaration as our foundational document right below the declaration. It holds the declaration up. Article 7 of the Constitution um, brings the Constitution right on top of that declaration. So both documents go together. So when you look at what we have with our form of government that we celebrate every year on our birthday, the 4th of July, it has produced what is now known as American exceptionalism. Now, that term is a term that we don't use much in schools anymore, but it's a term that we used in previous generations. It was a term that was actually introduced back in the 1830s by a man named Alexei de Tocqueville. You may recall Alexei de Tocqueville because he's the guy who did the famous book, Democracy in America. What he did was he came to America from 1831 to 1835, traveled across the nation. He was from Europe. He was from France. He said, you know what those Americans are doing is really special. It's really different. We've never seen any of that kind of stuff here in Europe. Why are they so different? And so he went for four years and went all over the nation looking to see what made us different. Went back and for Europeans and for Frenchmen, he wrote the book to say, here's what's different about America. Here, here's why they are what they are. And after having looked closely at this nation for four years, this is what he said back in the 1830s. He talked about what we call American exceptionalism. He said, the position of the Americans is quite exceptional, and it may be believed that no democratic people will ever be placed in a similar one. We were only 50 years old. He said, man, when I look at what those Americans are doing, it's exceptional. I don't think any other nation will ever do what they've done. So that term American exceptionalism has proven to be an accurate term. As a matter of fact, if you look at where we are today in America, we've had one form of government, that declaration, we've had one form of government. And if you look at other nations in the world, it's been quite different. Same period of time we've had one form of government. France has had 15 different governments just in the same period of time. If you look even at just the 20th century, Afghanistan had five different constitutions of the 20th century. Poland's had seven since 1921. Uh, you've had Russia with four since 1917. And you can go through the other nations as well. If you look at the United Nations this year, there's 192 nations at the UN. And that number goes up and down every year. Depends on who conquers whom and who revolts from who and who starts their own nation. 192 nations this year. America is the only nation in the world that does not average a revolution every 30 to 40 years. And we kind of take it for granted. We just assume that stability is natural, and stability is not natural. Uh, as a matter of fact, Jesus told us there should be wars and rumors of wars. If that way when he left, it'll be that way till he gets back. That's normal. What America has experienced is not normal. Now, when you look at, at this exceptional 
position we've been placed in, suddenly in America in the last few decades there's been this move that, you know, Europe is the older experienced nation. They've been there for a lot longer in America. Why don't we kind of be like sophisticated Europe? And, you know, what they do with government's pretty good, and what they do with civil rights is real good, and what they do with health care is real good. And there's this movement to be kind of like Europe. And we're even seeing it at the U.S. Supreme Court where Supreme Court justices are quoting what Europe does instead of what America does. Let's be like Europe. Let's, let's do what they do with their laws. You know, 200, 200 years ago, there was the same kind of intellectual elite movement that was going in America that said, hey, let's be like Europe. And at that point in time, Thomas Jefferson addressed that movement. I thought he made a statement that still is applicable today. Thomas Jefferson said this. He said, the comparisons of our government with those of Europe are like a comparison of heaven and hell. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, why would we give up the stability and the prosperity and the exceptionalness that we... And by the way, this is not a comment on American pride. This has nothing to do... It's not, we're not blessed in America because we have a four-syllable word with an A on each end. We've been blessed in America because we've adopted certain principles that God was able to bless across that time. See, that's what we knew made us different from other nations even back then. Andrew Jackson, President of the United States, put his finger on it when he said this. He said, the Bible is the rock on which our republic rests. That's what made us different from other nations. That's why God's been able to bless us in ways that other nations... It's not that God's a respecter of persons. He's not a respecter of nations. Any nation that will use his principles, God will bless. Any person that will use his principles, God will bless. That. It's real simple. But America has done that across the years. It's just that we have seem to have forgotten that in our own history. So when you look at this exceptionalism that we've enjoyed today, if we say, well... Who are the people responsible for American success? Who, who are the people who gave us this, this independence that we now enjoy? Today, if you look in our textbooks, you'll find that, well, we credit people like George Washington, and, and we'll credit people like Thomas Jefferson, and we'll say, you know, John Hancock is certainly one of the leaders, that big, bold signature on the Declaration of Independence as the President of Congress, and we'll, we'll say John Adams. And by the way, the cool thing about John Adams is we're kind of rediscovering who he was, David McCullough's book, and, and now... TV specials, miniseries that have been out there. We're kind of rediscovering some of our founding fathers. And these are the folks that we would say, these are the ones responsible for American independence. And that's okay because they are significant. But what I really find intriguing is when you go back into their writings 200 years ago and you let them talk about who the leaders were, you get a whole different set of names. As a matter of fact, in 1816, John Adams, 40 years after the American Revolution, looking back on it, we're now an established nation. He said, you know... The people that we look to, the people that we can point to and say they're responsible for American independence, they included people like the Reverend Dr. Samuel Cooper, the Reverend Dr. Jonathan Mayhew. Of course, you had the Reverend George Whitfield. Oh, and there's the Reverend Charles Chauncey. I mean, he went through and listed all these preachers. Now, we don't hear this in any textbooks today. And we might know who Whitfield is, but the chances that we know anything about Cooper or Mayhew, Chauncey, slim to none. Not only do we not study these preachers, we don't study the black preachers who had such an impact in the American founding. We know very little about folks like Richard Allen or Absalom Jones or John Moran or Lemuel Haynes. The huge impact that preachers had in the American founding, black and white, we don't study that today. And while we're on things we don't study, you know, we do know about Paul Revere, the midnight ride of Paul Revere, the famous poem Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, that, that ride that Revere... Well, Revere was not the only one riding. Uh, matter of fact, there was another guy riding at that time. His name was Wentworth Cheswell. Wentworth Cheswell was a black patriot. He was elected to office in New Hampshire in 1768. He was a leader in his church. He was reelected in New Hampshire for the next 45 years, held about nine different political offices in New Hampshire. Well, we didn't know that blacks and whites were both riding, giving the alarm that night. Absolutely. You see, there's so much about American history we don't hear. What we'll usually hear is the negative aspects, and sometimes we say, you know, and particularly in civil rights, we get a southern view of civil rights. We don't get the other view that was often out there. There are so many patriots we don't hear about today, in addition to folks like went with Cheswell. If you go six weeks later over to when we had the Battle of Bunker Hill, you know the hero of Bunker Hill is right there in the painting. We just don't talk about it anymore. But his name is Peter Salem. Peter Salem right there and right beside him is David Grosvenor, black and white, fighting side by side in the American Revolution. But Peter Salem is the one who got all the special honors and awards and commendations. More than a dozen different awards from the National Congress, from the State Congress, from his military leaders. I mean, he was the hero. He saved countless American lives that day, but we've never even heard of Peter Salem 
them today. In the same way, we'll see the picture of George Washington crossing the Delaware, but we wouldn't recognize folks like Prince Whipple and Oliver Cromwell, two black patriots who served throughout the American Revolution with the general and the general staff throughout the revolution. Never even heard of those guys. And then if you even move to the last battle of the American Revolution, the Battle of Yorktown, certainly we're going to hear about the young General Marquis de Lafayette, but we don't talk about the other guys standing there right in the painting with him, and that's James Armistead. James Armistead is the hero of Yorktown. He's the first double spy we had in the American Revolution. It's because of what he did that we were able to trap the British, cut months off the revolution, save countless scores of lives. James Armistead, hero. We just haven't heard these guys before. So there's so much of our history we don't hear. And I don't say this lightly. I've been appointed by a number of state boards of education in several states to help write the history and government standard for students in those states. I know what's in the textbooks, but I also know what's in history because we've got so much of the stuff. We read so many of the older books. And so as you go back to John Adams, why would John Adams point to preachers and say, well, these are the guys that, that we can look to that, that were so influential in American independence? Well, it's because when you read the Declaration of Independence, and by the way, that's a great thing to do is read the Declaration of Independence. Rarely do we do that. We're often told that the Founding Fathers did the Declaration of Independence because taxation without representation. That's why they birthed America. They, they didn't like what was going on economically, so taxation without representation, here we are today. That's okay as far as it goes, but the problem is the Declaration of Independence listed 27 reasons that they separated from Great Britain. Taxation without representation was issue number 17 out of the 27. It didn't even make the top half of what concerned them, and that's the only one we focus on. We have so bored into economics being everything that a nation is that we've missed so many of the moral and religious aspects that have been out there really for centuries. So when you look at the Declaration of Independence, you look at those 27 clauses, you look at the rights that are set forth in the Declaration of Independence. Historians have documented that every right set forth in the Declaration of Independence had been preached from the American pulpit prior to 1763. And you know what that means? That means the Declaration of Independence is nothing more than a listing of the sermons that we've been hearing in church for the last couple of decades leading up to the Revolution. That's what the Declaration is. And so when you look at these individuals that, that we celebrate on the 4th of July that, that gave us this Declaration of Independence, our birth certificate, it's kind of fun to see how they got their start. If you'll go to any public library or just go online, you can read the records of Congress, the records of everything that's gone on in Congress. And if you'll go back to page one, you'll see the very first time that these founding fathers got together, the very first session of the very first Congress of the United States, September the 6th, 1774. And if you'll read the records of Congress, you'll say, oh, look, they opened with prayer. And you keep reading, you say, hmm, that wasn't a dicky little prayer, was it? No, it wasn't. According to historical records, some records indicate that the opening prayer session in Congress ran up to three hours long, just in the opening prayer session in Congress. Now, it was such a significant time, and so many delegates wrote about it, that you take someone like Silas Dean. He said that after that time of prayer in Congress, he said even the stern old Quakers had tears running down their cheeks. And the Quakers are the least likely to cry. That's why they're called the stern old Quakers. Even they were crying after that time of prayer in Congress. And it wasn't just a time of prayer. You see, John Adams specifically said that in Congress that morning, he told Abigail, he said in Congress that morning they had Bible study. They studied four chapters of the Bible that morning in Congress. And he said that God so spoke to them in one chapter. God so changed what they saw by reading that one chapter out of the four that it they had the faith that, you know, maybe we can defeat the British in the coming conflict. So he wrote a letter to Abigail, and he said, Abigail, you got to see this chapter that, that we had this morning in Congress. And he told her very, very bluntly, he said, Abigail, I must beg you to read that psalm. He said, read the 35th Psalm to your friends and then read it to your father. See, Psalm 35 is what God really used to change their whole perspective that morning. And he said, Abigail, I want you to read it. Then I want you to show it to all your friends. Then I want you to show it to your dad. And her father was the minister of their church, Reverend William Smith, who's a preacher of their church. He said, you got to let everybody know what we did in the Congress this morning with the 35th Psalm. Man, we didn't know they had a Bible study, much less that God spoke to them out of that Bible study. And on top of that, he said, Abigail, that's not all. He said, Abigail, he said, we've appointed a continental fast. We've got three million people in America back then, and we've called all of them to a day of fasting and prayer. And he expected good things, as he told her. He says, millions would be up on their knees at once before their great creator, imploring his forgiveness and blessings, his smiles on American council and arms. He said, can you imagine the impact of having three million Americans, the whole nation, pray and fast before God? Now, 
That started a tradition of congressional prayer proclamations. It was the first of 15 congressional prayer proclamations, and that proclamation was for a time of fasting, humiliation, and prayer. We got real needs, so we're serious about going to God and say, God, we humble ourselves, and we're fasting and praying. We got to have your intervention. Well, you know, if you're going to be proper about the thing, you expect God to answer your prayers. When you get serious about praying, you want God to answer. And if you're really going to be respectful toward God when he does answer, you need to remember to say thank you for answering our prayers. And that's why you'll find that just a few months after the time of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, Congress said, you know, we need a time of prayer and thanksgiving. You remember all those things we prayed and fasted about? God answered those prayers. So we're calling the nation to have a time of prayer and thanksgiving. Thank God for answering all those prayers. And then a few months later, they say, you know, we got all these needs going now. So we need another day of fasting, humiliation, and prayer, which they did. And then a few months later, they said, you remember all that praying and fasting we did? God answered the prayers. Let's have another day of prayer and thanksgiving. Fifteen times throughout the American Revolution, it alternated between a time of prayer and fasting and prayer and thanksgiving and prayer and fasting and prayer 15 times. And we saw God weigh in in such miraculous ways so often, just so many ways that just defy logic and explanation, except God did it, that by 1778, our commander-in-chief, George Washington, who's on the ground seeing all these battles, I mean, it was obvious to him as well. 1778, George Washington declared this. He said, the hand of providence has been so conspicuous in all this that he must be worse than an infidel that lacks faith and more than wicked that hath not gratitude enough to acknowledge his obligations. If you can't stop and see what God has done and thank him, if you can't acknowledge your obligations to thank God for what he's done, you got to be worse than an infidel. You've you got to be flat wicked if you cannot see what God has done and acknowledge your obligations to thank him for what he's done. See, that was the tone, and that's what we saw throughout, and that's what the, it's in their official writings. And that's why when you get to 1781, which is the end of the American Revolution, the final major battle of the American Revolution, the Battle of Yorktown, that's when the British lay down their arms. They say, okay, we give up. Now, that's a significant time because at that point in time, we're no longer under the laws of the British. We're out from under the British kings. We no longer have a monarch. We have now proven that we have an independent nation that's been established even through, through that, that conflict. So what makes that significant is being out from under the laws of the kings. One of the laws the kings had passed was a very simple law. It had been passed decades earlier. It says if you live in an English-speaking colony, America, you cannot print any Bible in the English language. Now, we printed Bibles in every other language. 1661, John Eliot, the Apostle of the Indians, printed the first Bible in America, but it was in the Massachusetts Indian language. We printed Bibles in Massachusetts, Cherokee, and Shawnee, and Ojibwe. We printed them in Russian, French, Italian, Latin, Spanish, you name it. We printed it in every language there was except English because by British law, we could not do that. But having whipped the British Yorktown, we're not under that law anymore, so now we can print our first English language Bible. Within a month of Yorktown, the plans advanced to print that first English language Bible. Eleven months later, that Bible rolled off the presses. Now, it's become one of the rarest books in the world. When it rolled off the presses in 1782, they printed 20,000 copies of that first English language Bible. Today, there's only 29 left in the world. I have one. Library of Congress has one. Um, I don't have, I, I don't carry the original with me because it's just too delicate, but I carry a duplicate. This is what it looks like. First Bible printed in the English language in America. The original you see here, this is the Bible, 1782. This is called the Bible of the American Revolution. You know what's significant about this Bible? First Bible printed in English in America. You know who printed it? The Congress of the United States printed this. Whoa, time out. The Founding Fathers printed the first Bible in English in America. Why would they do that? They tell us, and the records of Congress included here, they tell us that this Bible is, quote, a neat edition of the Holy Scriptures for the use of our schools, end quote. I thought they didn't want the Bible in schools. Let's go back to the first public school law ever passed in America, 1647, passed in Connecticut, passed in Massachusetts. Do you know what the title of the first public school law in America was? It was called the Old Deluder Satan Act. It was called that because it says it being the one chief project that an old deluder Satan to keep us from the knowledge of the scriptures as he has in former times. Since Satan's number one purpose is to keep us out of the scriptures, we're not letting it happen in America. That's why we're starting public schools. For the next 320 years, the Bible was part of public education in America, hands down. The first time it was not was on June the 17th of 1963 when the Supreme Court issued a double decision and Abbott and Shimp and Murray Corlett where they said, you know, 
this thing about the Bible schools anymore, we're not going to do that. You know, for 320 years we did. What we think today is we think the way it's been for the last 50 years is the way it's always been. No, not by a long shot. This Bible by itself proves it. Do you know that Bible even had a congressional endorsement in front of it? That Bible said, resolved the United States and Congress assembled, recommend this edition of the Bible to the inhabitants of the United States. This is in the American Revolution? Yes, it was not a secular revolution. In every aspect, we tried to keep God. We tried to acknowledge God. We tried to see the principles. We tried to keep the scriptures there. And even when we signed the peace treaty the next year in 1783, and by the way, the four people you see on the peace treaty signatures there, the, the guy on the right, halfway off the screen, is David Hartley, the British ambassador. Moving from right to left, you see the three Americans, Ben Franklin, John Adams, and John Jay. Those are the four that signed the treaty. If you want to see the treaty, you go to Washington, D.C., to the State Department. You go up on the sixth floor of the John Quincy Adams State Drawing Room, and you get to see the treaty. And if you look at the treaty, you'll see the four wax seals. See on the bottom left there, David Harley, the British ambassador, then John Adams, Benjamin Franklin, John Jay, and you see at the top left, there's ten articles to the treaty that established American independence. We declared it with the Declaration. We established it with this peace treaty. And by the way, look at the title the Founding Fathers put on the peace treaty. See the title in the top right? In the name of the most holy and undivided trinity. I could be wrong, but that sounds Christian to me. <laughs> they say, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, a Trinitarian invocation, in the name of the most holy and undivided Trinity. And today we're told, oh, no, they wouldn't want under God in the Pledge of Allegiance. They wouldn't want in God we trust out in public. Really? When they have acknowledgments like that on official documents, it was that way throughout the American Revolution. And John Adams, who saw it, John Adams, who signed not only the Declaration, but he's one of only three that signed the Peace Treaty eight years later. John Adams said it as clear as it could be said. The general principles on which the fathers achieved independence were the general principles of Christianity. Now, we spend a lot of time today saying, no, he didn't know what he was talking about. I love collecting articles from professors and others. Here's one that ran recently, Stephen Morris. He said the founding fathers were not Christians. I don't care what John said. He didn't know what he's talking about. I love it that 200 years later, we're so much smarter than the guys who were actually there who actually saw it, you know. But we got PhDs, so we know what we're talking about. They didn't have PhDs. So we get articles like this, and here's the LA Times. The LA Times says America's unchristian beginnings. They said the founding fathers were deists who rejected the divinity of Jesus. A whole chain of newspapers out on the East Coast ran this article, said the authors of the Declaration were enemies of Christ. And I speak at, at law schools and universities across the nation. Last several years, the most widely used book I've seen has been one called The Godless Constitution. We specifically tell the next generation of Americans that America has lasted this long because we've been secular from the beginning. We have a godless constitution. And that's why we've been such a great nation. Now, how do we know it's a godless constitution? Because as you just saw the articles, all the founding fathers who wrote it were all godless. I mean, the founding fathers were atheists and agnostics and deists, and you can't spec expect a bunch of secular guys to give you something religious. No, godless founders give you a godless constitution. Now, a lot of people buy into that, and I was recently at a, a major law school, a very prestigious law school, and I put up the picture of the 56 signers of the Declaration. I said, students, all these postgraduate kids in law school, I said, who do you recognize up there? And everyone instantly found Thomas Jefferson, everyone instantly found Benjamin Franklin. And that's exactly where it stopped. And I said, no, wait a minute. There's 56 up there, and you found two? Give me some of the others. And I, I said, let's, let's just go across the front row. You point out to me which one of these guys is Richard Henry Lee, uh, which one is George Clinton, uh, which one is Sam Adams. Just continue across the front row. Which one is Charles Carroll, and which one is Robert Morris, and which one is Benjamin Rush. And let's go back uh, up to the second row. Uh, which one is Stephen Hopkins, and which one is William Williams. And back to the front row, the guy leaning on his arm, that's Elbridge Jerry, and right beside him is Robert Tree Payne. And I just go through the other 54 names, and they say, who? We've never heard of those names before. Isn't it interesting that we've all been trained to recognize the two least religious founding fathers? We can find Jefferson, we can find Franklin, we can't find any others, but it doesn't matter. They're all like Jefferson and Franklin anyway. Really? Do you know out of the 56 guys who signed the Declaration of Independence, 29 of them had seminary degrees? That's not bad for a bunch of atheists to have seminary degrees, and apparently it's what we had going on back then. See, we used to know better than that. We would never have bought into the fact that they were secular or they wanted a secular nation because we knew our history too well. Uh, there's actually a great history book that was printed in 1848 that we used in public schools for generations. It's called Lives of the Signers of the Declaration of Independence. We've actually reprinted that, but it has four, five, six pages on every one of those 56 signers. And in public schools for years, we knew everyone. We knew their faith. We knew their character. We knew all about them, but we don't today. See, folks we don't talk about today include folks like signer of the Declaration, John Withers. 
Witherspoon. Now, John Witherspoon, one of the most prominent signers of the Declaration, he served on over 100 committees in Congress, including the Board of War. He's George Washington's boss in the Revolution. He's also the president of Princeton University. He's also the best-known gospel evangelist in American history back then, has more than a dozen volumes of published gospel sermons. Americans couldn't wait for his next volume of sermons to come out. And he's also responsible for two American editions of the Bible, including this one right here. This is original from 1791. This is done by Dr. John Witherspoon, signer of the Declaration. This is considered America's very first family Bible. He did this Bible so that families could have Bible studies together. Now, because he is such a well-known founder back then, he has numerous writings. And if you read his writings, you'll find statements like this. He says, I entreat you in the most earnest manner to believe in Jesus Christ, for there is no salvation in any other, Acts 4.12. If you're not reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, if you're not clothed with the spotless robe of his righteousness, you must forever perish. That sounds kind of evangelical to me. I mean, I've, I'm not used to atheists talking like this, and apparently he's one of our atheist founding fathers. You know, other founding fathers we don't talk about include Charles Thompson. Charles Thompson, uh, Thompson was one of only two guys who signed the original Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July. It was the 19th of July that the founders got an idea and said, why don't we create a declaration we can all sign. So on the 2nd of August is when they signed the one that we see and celebrate. But the 4th of July, Charles Thompson one of the only two who signed it. But Charles Thompson is also a theologian. He's responsible for this work right here. This is the original. This is called Thompson's Bible. You can still get this in Christian bookstores today. Now, not to be confused with Thompson's Chain Reference Bible. That's T-H-O-M-P-S-O-N. This is T-H-O-M-S-O-N. This is the first translation of the Greek Septuagint into English. It took Charles 25 years to make this translation, and we still sell it today as one of the most scholarly of American translations of the Bible. And he was very outspoken about his faith as well. He says very simply, I am a Christian. I believe only in the Scriptures and in Jesus Christ my Savior. That's kind of pointed. I mean, that's just real simple, real succinct. And then you have founding fathers like Dr. Benjamin Rush. He is certainly one of my favorite founding fathers. We don't study him much anymore, but when he died in 1813, the other founders still alive, like John Adams, said Benjamin Rush is one of the three most notable founding fathers. John Adams said he got George Washington, Ben Franklin, and Benjamin Rush, and we don't have a clue who this guy is today. And he had such an impact on America. You see, among other things, he started five universities. Three of them still go today. He's called the father of public schools under the Constitution. He did the first faith-based prison movement in America. He is the leader of the civil rights movement. He started the first abolition society in America. He helped found the first black denomination in America, the AME denomination. Uh, on top of that, he served in three presidential administrations. He is called the father of American medicine. 3,000 students got their medical degree with his signature on the diploma. He started the American College of Physicians. I can go through all the stuff he did. You know, we knew exactly who Benjamin Rush was, but we don't today. And because of that, we have no clue that this is the man who started the Sunday School Movement in America. Do you know a signer of the Declaration of Independence started the Sunday School Movement in America? He's also the man who penned this work right here. This is the constitution for the very first Bible society ever done in America. Now, why would he start a Bible society? He tells us. He says, if we can get Americans to read the Bible, he said two things will happen. Number one, they'll become Christians. They'll find out how to have a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. He said, number two, if we can get them to read the Bible and obey what they read in the Bible, he said, we'll solve all of our social problems. We won't have crime. We won't have slavery. He went through all the things we wouldn't have. So he wants a Bible in the hand of every American. And in looking to get a Bible in the hands of every American, he came up with a new way to print books. It's called stereotyped printing. It's an early form of mass production. But here's the result. This is the first stereotyped Bible ever done in the history of the United States. It's done by a sign of the Declaration, Dr. Benjamin Russ. This is the Bible designed that you could buy it cheap and give it out to your friends. This is what you use to, to, to get them to read the scriptures and bring them to Christ. And because he is such a well-known political figure, every generation knew him. He has so many writings, and if you read his writings, he is so out front about his Christian faith. You find statements like this. He said, My only hope of salvation is the infinite and transcendent love of God manifested to the world by the death of his Son upon the cross. He says, Nothing but his blood will wash away my sins. I rely exclusively upon it. Come, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. Pretty good doctrine for an atheist. But see, again, 
He is one of the top three founders. We don't even know him today. We've learned to teach the exception and not the rule. We can talk about the two, but we won't talk about the 54. Another founder that we say very little about today is Francis Hopkinson. Now, Francis Hopkinson is a really cool guy. Francis Hopkinson was one of the very first federal judges appointed by George Washington. Francis Hopkinson is also the man who designed the American flag. So flag back there is the product of Francis Hopkinson. He's the guy who designed our American flag and allowed us to have that thing where we can keep adding stars up there. Francis Hopkins was also a church music director, a choir leader, and an organist, and he is responsible for this work here. This is from 1767. This is America's first purely American hymn book. What signed with the declaration Francis Hopkinson did was he took the entire book of Psalms and set the entire book of Psalms to music so that we could sing the Psalms like David had sung the Psalms thousands of years earlier. Now, can you imagine setting the entire book of Psalms to music? I mean, for that matter, can you imagine just setting Psalms 119 to music? And that would seem to be a live project. And if you did get Psalms 119 set to music, how many church services would it take you to sing Psalms 119? <laughs> I'll point out that in this hymn book, he set Psalms 119 to music, and that hymn is 62 pages long in the hymn book. One hymn that he did, 62 pages long. Well, in addition to Francis Hopkinson, we have founding fathers like Sam Adams. Sam Adams, you recognize, he's the father of the American Revolution, went to be the governor of Massachusetts. He has so many public papers. You read his papers, you find declarations like this. I rely on the merits of Jesus Christ for pardon of all my sins. Very simple, very succinct. You also have founding fathers like Roger Sherman. Roger Sherman, one of my favorite founding fathers. He is the only founding father to sign all four founding documents. He signed the Declaration, the Constitution, the Articles of Confederation, and the Articles of Association. No other founder signed all the documents. He is called the master builder of the Constitution. He's the guy who came up with the bicameral system that we have with the House and the Senate. He's also a framer of the Bill of Rights. He's the guy who got George Washington to our very first federal Thanksgiving proclamation in Congress. He went through the Bible verse is explaining why, now that we're a federal nation, we ought to have a Thanksgiving problem. Just a really cool guy. He's a judge. He's the mayor of New Haven, Connecticut. He's a surveyor. He's all sorts of stuff. He's also a theologian for his denomination in the state of Connecticut. He actually wrote the denominational creed for his denomination, and that's why he's a theologian. And if you read his writings, you find statements like this. God commands all men everywhere to repent. He also commands them to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and assured us that all who do repent and believe shall be saved. God has promised to bestow eternal blessings on all those who are willing to accept him on the terms of the gospel. That is, in a way, a free grace through the atonement. That's pretty orthodox Christianity. And by the way, he was a long-term member of Congress, served for years and years. Here's actually a newspaper article. You see it dated 1837. Talking about Roger Sherman, it says, The volume which he consulted more than any other was the Bible. It was his custom, the commencement of every session of Congress, to purchase a copy of the Scriptures, to peruse it daily, and to present it to one of his children on his return. Roger Sherman, like so many of the Founding Fathers, believed that you should read through the Bible from cover to cover once a year. Now, that's a good practice for all of us to do, but he would do it, and every year when he went to Congress, he'd get a new copy of the Bible, and as he would read it day by day, he'd make notes out in the margins, he's going through it, and when he got home, he'd give it to one of his kids. And it did take him a while to get to all of his kids. He had 15 kids, so he had to read the Bible through a lot of times to get a Bible to every kid, but that was a practice, read through the Bible once a year. So Roger Sherman's a founder we don't talk much about. He's a very significant founder. John Adams, we do know something about because John Adams, uh, again, we're starting to recapture knowledge of him, but we don't have, know much about his faith anymore, but we should. It's all over his letters. As a matter of fact, I brought an original John Adams letter. If you've never seen one by John Adams, there, there it is. It's, it's here. And I'll, I just want to read you part of what's in this, this simple John Adams letter. Uh, you see the letter right here. I'm just going to read off the bottom part here, the bottom paragraph. You can see the first three words. This is the Holy Ghost. See that? Here's what he says. He says, The Holy Ghost carries on the whole Christian system and His truth. Not a baptism, not a marriage, not a sacrament can be administered but by the Holy Ghost. He says, There is no authority, civil or religious. There can be no legitimate government but what is administered by the Holy Ghost. There can be no salvation without it. All without is rebellion and perdition or, in more orthodox words, damnation. I don't think I saw that on the TV specials with John Adams recently. You know, they managed to keep faith completely out of Adams. And you can't do that if you read his writings. And you want to find somebody who is a real Bible thumper, you read the writings of Abigail Adams. Abigail's letters are online. I mean, she is so passionate about Christ. And, and, and she told John Quincy Adams, John Quincy Adams, her young son, is going overseas. He's received a congressional diplomatic appointment. He's going over there. He's 11 years old, going overseas on his first diplomatic mission. And she tells John Quincy, she said, you know how I've raised you. 
You know how you've been raised in church and with the scriptures. You've been taught scriptures. You've been taught morality. It is so important that my prayer is that if you're going to get to Europe, if you're going to get to France and act immoral, if you're going to get there and give up your faith, I pray that God would sink you in the ocean and drown you before you get to France if you're going to give up your faith. Whoa! And she is really passionate about Christianity and faith and how important it is and how important it is to maintain that relationship with Christ. We never hear that about John Adams at all. And you have founding fathers like Charles Carroll. Charles Carroll of Carrollton is not only a signer of the Declaration, he is also a framer of the Bill of Rights. And he was very outspoken about the role that Christ had played in the founding of the nation. Matter of fact, this is one of his statements. He says, I'm grateful to Almighty God for the blessings which, through Jesus Christ our Lord, he's conferred on my beloved country. See, we're told today, oh no, we're not a Christian nation. We, no. History says we were. They were proud of the fact we were. And by the way, see, they get it all wrong today. Say a Christian nation, that's exclusive. No, no, no. A Christian nation is the one nation that allows other religions to come and be there. You see, we had Jews in America in synagogues in 1654. We had Muslims in America in 1619. We had, uh, we're doing Korans in America in the, the early 1800s. We had Buddhist temples in America in the early 1800s. It was all back there. Well, how can you be a Christian nation and have all these other religions? It's really simple. We believe as Christians that if you'll just share the truth, the truth will win out. The Holy Spirit will take it. We're not scared of other religions. We're just like Elijah on top of, of Mount Carmel. 400 false prophets of God, 450 prophets of Baal. It's 850 to 1. He says, you guys practice your faith all you want to. Take all the time you want. He said, just make sure I get my shot at it. See, that's what we believe is when you put it in a free market setting, Christianity is going to win out every time. That's why in a true Christian nation, you have religious freedom. You have religious tolerance. You have the rights of conscience. Secular nations do not do that. We we better stay a Christian nation if we want to enjoy religious freedom for all people, all places. It's just the whole concept of free market, even as applied to economics, comes out of the Bible. 1 Timothy 5, 8, 2 Thessalonians 3, 10. If we're not a Christian nation, we'll lose a free market form of capitalism. All the things that we've come to accept, we think that that's secular. No, it came out of the Bible. These guys knew it, and they talked about it. It's just that we don't talk about our history anymore. As long as we stay a Christian nation, everyone else will be welcome here. We'll continue to protect the rights of everyone. That only happens when you have a Christian nation. It doesn't happen with other religions. It does not happen with secular. It happens with Christian. Well, continuing to go through, you see these kind of declarations. By the way, Charles Carroll was the final surviving signer of the Declaration to Die. He died at the age of 95 years old. He outlived his kids. He outlived his grandkids. I mean, he lived a long time. And somebody asked him, said, Charles, you will die someday. And when you do die, are you ready to meet God when you die? He answered that with this letter. This is his handwritten letter. Charles Carroll of Carrollton, same way he signed the declaration. You can see the, the letter up here. It's dated up top, 1825, which makes him 89 years old at that point. The question is, are you ready to meet God when you die? And he's got a very clear answer right here. He says, of course I am. He says, on the mercy of my Redeemer, I rely for salvation and on his merits, not on the works I've done in obedience to his precepts. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. By grace you saved through faith, not of works, lest they mention both. Real simple. And I can go through others like this. I've got their letters. It's online. The stuff is posted. You can see it. And we're told that, oh, no, the signers of the Declaration were enemies of Christ. And how is that possible? It's possible because we don't know who they are. We're told that these are the guys who gave us a godless constitution. How can that be? Now, this particular book is written by Cramnick and Moore, two professors at Cornell University. I've shown you some original documents this morning. There are so many more. The Library of Congress has a huge display of these original religious documents. Library of Congress has put it all out. There's so many documents out there. How can these two professors claim that all the founders were atheists and agnostics and deists? This is where it's important. In every academic book, go to the back of the book and look at the footnotes. Look at the sources they have. So we go look at the sources in the back of this college textbook. And they tell us right up front, we have dispensed with the usual scholarly apparatus of footnotes. <laughs> uh, isn't that interesting? This is revisionism, and this is how it works. We make claims. We don't have to document them. We'll, we'll just go on the media and say, oh, no, no, America's not a Christian nation. We don't have to document that. We'll just keep saying it until everybody believes it. See, and that's what happens with this whole notion. When we know who we are, when we know our history, we, do, we have a completely different response. As a matter of fact, we've been very blessed as a nation. No question about that. Blessed is that nation whose God is the Lord. When you look at our foundations and our history, even though there's warts and blemishes and things were done wrong, we still tried more than any other nation in, in that era to apply 
apply biblical principles where we could. And God blessed that. He responded to that. But we're also told in the scriptures that if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? So what are the foundations? Because the foundations have to be protected from generation to generation. If we lose those foundations, we'll lose the whole building that sits on top of that foundation. So what are the foundations? Well, I think George Washington properly identified them. Now, remember, George Washington, father of his country, gave 45 years of his adult life into public service, military service. He presided over the convention that wrote the Constitution. He signed the Constitution. He presided over the framing of the Bill of Rights. He's the first president for two terms, and then he resigns. He's now an old man. After 45 years of public service, he gives his farewell address. And in that address, he reminds Americans, he says, the guys, we need to remember what brought us here. We need to remember what's made us different from all the other nations across Europe and the rest of the world. We have to remember what our foundations are. And so he reminded us very clearly in that farewell address. He said, of all the habits and dispositions that lead to political prosperity, religion and morality are indispensable supports. If you want your politics to prosper, the two things you will not separate will be religion and morality. If you want politics and government to work well, if you want to be, if you want American exceptionalism, if you want the government to do right, if you want prosperity, if you want all this, then you won't separate religion and morality from political life. Now, that was such a strong belief that he even went further with an added sentence. And I would suggest that George Washington clearly is a patriot. No question about it. I think he knows a patriot when he sees one because he was surrounded with a valley fortune throughout the American Revolution. He gave us a litmus test for patriotism. Very next sentence, this is what he said. He said, in vain would that man claim the tribute of patriotism who should labor to subvert these great pillars. He said, anyone who tries to remove religion and morality from public life, I don't let them call themselves a patriot because they're trying to destroy the country. That's pretty serious stuff that he's talking about. Now, I will tell you, we used to read George Washington's farewell address. It's considered the most significant political address ever delivered by any U.S. president. You will find that, for example, in the war between the states, uh, President Lincoln even set aside a whole day and said, all right, I want the entire Union Army doing nothing but reading George Washington's farewell address on this day. In World War I, Woodrow Wilson set aside a day, had the entire American Army just study Washington's farewell address. We had it in every college textbook. We had it in every high school government textbook. We studied this because it was the the map. It showed us how we'd become what we were and what we had to do to preserve it. We haven't seen this in a textbook in 40 years. It's gone away. And he says, the only thing that makes our politics prosper is to keep religion and morality part of what we do and don't let anyone call themselves a patriot if they try to separate that. So religion and morality are indispensable foundations. That's what we have to preserve. And see, as we look at a 4th of July kind of a celebration time, it's fun to celebrate, but there's responsibilities that go with that as well. I think one of the great responsibilities was put forth by a man named Matthias Burnett. That's on how to preserve the foundations. Matthias Burnett was a famous preacher in Connecticut. And you may not be aware of this, but it used to be a tradition in America that we opened state legislative sessions by having a joint session of the state legislature. We got the House and the Senate, the governor, lieutenant governor, got them all together, and we brought in a preacher to speak to the entire state government. Well, in 1803, he's the one who spoke to the Connecticut legislature. And what had happened was they just had their elections, so they had all the new representatives, all the new senators, everybody is there. Every, the whole Congress is, uh, of Connecticut, they're all there. And after having addressed them, he then looks up to all the citizens up in the gallery. Uh, all the citizens are there, and this is what he told the citizens. He said, citizens, he said to God and posterity, you're accountable for your rights and your rulers. Now, I think today a lot of Christians would say, I'm not accountable for my rulers. I didn't even vote last election. Exactly. You see, we've been given a stewardship with the vote that we've been given by God. He said, here's the vote. You take care of this till I get back. It's Matthew 25. It's Luke 19. It's the parable of the minas and the talents. We've been given that. He says, I'm giving you a vote. You take care of it till I get back. Come back. We'll have to answer for what we did with the vote, whether we used it or not, and how we used it, how we invested it. If we invested it wrong, we're going to be in trouble with the guy who gave us our vote, and that's God Almighty. We have a responsibility to God. But notice what else he said. He said, you're responsible not only to God, but you're responsible also to posterity. Now, posterity means generations yet unborn, generations yet to come. And this is talking about the future, what's on out there. And this is where we start getting into eschatology. And you know what eschatology is, study the end time. I love eschatology. I studied it for years and years. And you know all the different views. You can be pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, pan-trib, entrib, pre-millennial, post-millennial. You've got all the views. There's nothing that divides Christianity into more belief segments than eschatology. 
And I, I get emails from people all the time say, Barton, we appreciate what you're trying to do, but you do realize it's a waste of time. We're in the last days, it's all prophesied, nothing you can do to change it. And, and, and I get those kind of emails, and y- you know, that may be true. And I don't care what eschatological belief system you come from, everybody still has to deal with the very simple command given by Jesus in Luke 19, 13, where he said, Occupy till I come. I hope Jesus Christ comes back today and screws up every plan I've got. But just in case he doesn't, what do I leave for the next generation? What kind of stewardship have I had? We've been given blessings that no other nation in the history of the world has ever experienced. But they're not there because we had them last generation. They're only there because we maintain them from generation to generation. And that's why he said, to God and posterity, you're accountable for your rights and your rulers. Let not your children have reason to curse you for giving up those rights and prostrating those institutions which your fathers delivered to you. We are the stewards of the country, and as we celebrate, and this is a great time to celebrate, uh, another birthday, well over 230 years we've been celebrating this, we have to remember that we have a responsibility to preserve the foundations, and they are religion and morality, and we have to preserve them in public life. We have to apply that for the people we elect from dog catcher through President of the United States. We have to apply the same biblical standards if God is going to bless the nation. God bless you guys. Thanks for letting me share. Dr. Stanley and David Barton discuss today's message. That's still ahead on In Touch. Strengthen your relationship with Jesus throughout the week at InTouch.org. For example, If you recently became a Christian, we want to send you a free New Believers Kit to help you get started. Order Is America a Christian Nation from guest speaker David Barton. And help get the gospel to the world through the InTouch Messenger. Find all this and other resources at InTouch.org. I look forward to seeing you on the Celebration Bible Cruise 2010. We'll study God's Word together and have lots of fun in the sun at the same time. In Touch Ministries joins Templeton Tours on the Celebration Bible Cruise, March 1st through 6th. Sail aboard Carnival Cruise Line's fascination with stops at Freeport, Nassau, and Half Moon Cay. Space is limited, so plan your vacation today. Call 1-800-334-2630 or visit templetontours.com. What's going to happen? I can't do this alone. Has God forgotten me? Adversity is a bridge to a deeper relationship with God. The Charles F. Stanley Life Principles Bible helps you navigate life's uncertain times. Filled with 30 foundational truths, answers to life's questions, and more than 300 of God's promises to you. The Life Principles Bible. Strength for today. Filled with hope for tomorrow. The average age of the American soldier is 28. There are sons and daughters, friends and brothers. That's why we send the in-touch messenger to our troops, delivering Dr. Stanley's teaching to the front lines. I hope these messages have strengthened your faith in our Heavenly Father and drawn you closer to Him. To get involved, go to intouch.org slash troops. Honor our founding fathers and veterans. One nation under God. We the people in order to... Teach the next generation to stand firm in the service of freedom with messages from Dr. Charles Stanley. It is absolutely essential if our children are going to survive in this society that we teach them basic convictions. And David Barton. We've been given blessings that no other nation in the history of the world has ever experienced, but they're not there because we had them last generation. Order in the service of freedom. Go to intouch.org. It is my great pleasure and privilege to once again welcome historian David Barton to In Touch. Dave, good to see you again. Dr. Stanley, good to be with you, sir. So delighted that you're here. My pleasure. Well, there are lots of questions people have, and after your message for us uh, some time ago, we were all so blessed, and people by the hundreds of thousands were. And, of course, we got lots of questions, and so I'd just like to ask you a few of those this morning that might be helpful to a lot of people. And one of the first ones is, People want to know, well, how do you define a Christian nation anyway? A Christian nation, the way we've defined it historically, is that it's not a nation where everyone that's in the nation is a Christian. It's not a nation where that by law you establish Christianity. It means a nation whereby the Christian religion had a dramatic impact in the shaping of the culture and the institutions and the society of that nation. And by that definition, America is unequivocally a Christian nation. 
Uh, so many of the institutions we enjoy and cherish even today are direct results of verses and teachings out of the Bible that previous generations implemented. Uh, it's probably unfortunate today most Americans don't recognize how much of the culture we've come to accept actually comes out of the Bible. Um, but that is a Christian nation. And it's interesting that with that definition, we have several hundred court cases where the courts have said America is a Christian nation. Uh, virtually every president said America is a Christian nation. There's hundreds of acts of Congress that call us a Christian nation. And it's not because we've ever established the Christian religion. It's that Christianity is literally the atmosphere that this nation breathes, that keeps it alive, that keeps our institutions what they are. And it's just, it, it's, that's the definition historically used. And, you know, there are lots of stories about how God has intervened in our military mm -hmm. throughout the years. And I remember mm -hmm. and your message, I, I was so deeply impressed by some of the things you told us. And it would be interesting to hear some of that. You know, the, the emphasis that we've had as a Christian church on the military um, and, and the way that we've interacted has been really significant. Uh, here's actually a, a bunch of old sermons that these are, are called artillery sermons. But once a year, we would literally get the military together and we'd say, here's what the Word of God has as guidance to the military. And here's what it's even John the Baptist, when he was baptized, had specific instructions for officers and for soldiers. And, and so this sermon's from 1798, and they, they run all the way through for 200 years, about 170 years, actually, we had these military sermons. And so as a Christian people, we were very cognizant of what God's Word said. One of the verses I've always enjoyed is Psalms 144.1. And I've got to say, it was really kind of a mind-shaping experience for me to read that because I really believe that God gifts people with different abilities. You know, there's artists and there's musicians and there's athletes and not all right. of us can do that. Psalms 144.1, the scripture says that it's God that trains my hands for battle and my fingers for war. And I never thought about being in the military as being a specific gifting of God. But we used to recognize that. We knew that that was a calling from God. And so that's why the Bible addressed it so often. And it is not uh, surprising that so many of our military leaders would also place a real emphasis on what the Bible says about military. And when they got in the military, they would use the Bible. Uh, George Washington's one of my, my favorite examples. George Washington seven times asked his governor, said, we got to have chaplains from the military. We cannot be, he said, the whole world will think we're pagans if we don't have chaplains. And mm -hmm. he, he couldn't get the governors to give him chaplains from the military. So in, in a particular battle where he was involved, a number of the guys were shot down, and since there weren't chaplains, he performed the role of chaplain. He actually did the prayers. He did the sermons over the grave. He, he conducted the whole funeral service. And years later, 20 years later, when he gets named commander-in-chief, I find it significant that his very first order was to put chaplains in every regiment in the military. You know, to this day, the U.S. government spends tens of millions of dollars even today with 4,500 military chaplains that we fund for, for service and, and for all the spiritual needs that go on. I mean, we put a significant investment of money to this day in taking care of the spiritual needs of our soldiers, and, and that's something that George Washington started way back in the very beginning. Well, thinking about all that, you think about uh, history and you think about the future, uh, I've always felt like the better our history, the better our yeah. ability to predict the future. So it would be good for you to talk about that for a few moments. Yeah, h history does give us a good indication of what's to come. Um, significantly, uh, we, we go, from, you and I approach this thing from a biblical viewpoint that says man really doesn't change. Technology changes, man doesn't change. Right. That's why Ecclesiastes 1.9 says there's nothing new under the sun. And, and that certainly is true historically. And that's why God tells us in so many places uh, you, you've got Romans 15, 4, and you've you got Psalm 78 and 70, all these passages where God says, recall the former days, remember the former times. Right. When you forget your history, you got trouble. And that's why I like the story of Josiah, when, when they're rebuilding the temple and doing something good, getting God back in the center of the nation, and they found that old scroll, and they brought it out, and they read it, and they said, you mean we used to be like this? And even in the midst of doing something good, when they found their history, it led to a national revival. And so knowing our history is something that God uses time and time again to really get a nation or a people or a family directed back in the right direction. Uh, and that's why we have our, our faith hall of fame, Hebrews 11, all these heroes of our mm -hmm. faith that we're to go back and study and emulate. And there are examples and we can follow what they've done. That's history and it affects us today. So it really is a good predictor of what's coming in, in the future. Knowing our history or not knowing it, actually not knowing it probably affects our future more than knowing our history which will keep us on track. 
Well, I wish you could just sit here all morning with me and talk <laughs> because I've enjoyed it so much. And I do pray for you that God would give you the wonderful privilege of sharing this message all over this nation. It's so desperately needed. And I think he's certainly raised you up and equipped you over these years to be a tremendous trumpet sound of freedom and freedom not only of religion, but freedom in every aspect of our nation. And I just want to say thank you again for coming Thanks, to be brother. with us this morning. And we're going to have you again. I look forward to it. Thank Appreciate you very much. brother. Thank you. I trust that this message has helped you understand why Americans must turn to our Heavenly Father, reject sin, and choose to follow Jesus Christ. He's the only hope for this and any nation. Well, that's all the time we have this week on In Touch. Thanks for joining us today. And remember, obey God, leave all the consequences to Him, because that's living life at its very best. Touching the world with a passion for God and compassion for people. In Touch with Dr. Charles Stanley is a presentation of In Touch Ministries. This program is made possible by the grace of God and your faithful prayers and gifts.